Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The planchette on the Ouija board then moved to yes. I told my mom she was moving it, and she said she was not. My mother asked, who are you? The planchette then went to each letter and spelled Alberts. We did not know anyone by the name of Alberts, first or last name. Mom then asked, are you a good spirit? The planchette moved to yes and then no. Mom asked, how did you die? The planchette did not move from the middle of the board. I was getting scared at that point. So mom said, since you're not going to tell us, we're going to say goodbye now. The planchette slid to no. Mom said, we have to go. The planchette then went to goodbye. We took our fingers off the planchette and it was sitting in the middle of the board. Suddenly the planchette flew off the board. I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. I live in West Virginia. This is where my experience took place. I'm now over 50 years old, but I was just over 10 when this happened. My mother bought me a Ouija board, thinking it was a game. One night, while my dad was at work, we got out the board, lit a candle, and put it in the middle of the table. We placed our fingers lightly on the planchette. Mom asked if there was anyone there that wanted to speak to us. I was giggling, and she asked again. The planchette then moved to yes. I told mom she was moving it, and she said she was not. My mother asked, who are you? The planchette then went to each letter and spelled Alberts. We did not know anyone by the name of Alberts, first or last name. Mom then asked, are you a good spirit? The planchette moved to yes, and then no. Mom asked, how did you die? The planchette did not move from the middle of the board. I was getting scared at that point. So Mom said, since you're not going to tell us, we're going to say goodbye now. The planchette slid to no. Mom said, we have to go. The planchette then went to goodbye. We took our fingers off the planchette and it was sitting in the middle of the board. The planchette flew off the board and the round plastic piece where the middle pointer cracked. We put it away, tried to forget about it. We were both a little creeped out by the board. Where we lived, the floor was close to the ground and my room was at the end of the house. And that night, there was a growling sound coming up through the floor in the corner of my room. I went and got mom, she came in and it stopped. The weird thing is that my mother smoked at the time. That night her cigarettes smelled like sulfur. 
she said they tasted like sulfur as well. My dad could not smell it or taste it. I could smell the sulfur strong. My mother could too. He thought we were playing a joke on him. Three nights later, the growling started up in the corner of my room. I again went and got my mother. Dad was at home and Mommy told me to get the flashlight and go out and look for anything that could be making noise. While the growling was happening, Dad came in and said that nothing was under there. My mom proceeded to scream at it and tell it to stop. It got louder and sounded more like a low, deep growl, like it was going to come through the floor after my mom. It finally stopped that night. The next morning, my mother felt ill. We took her temperature. It was over 100. Dad took her to the hospital and they were so worried that they admitted her. She was diagnosed as having an infection. She was in there for a week. The whole time she was in the hospital, my room and the whole house was quiet. My mother and I truly believed the spirit of Albert's died from having an infection in his blood and was never treated for it and died from it. That is my first and last experience with a Ouija board, and I would never use one again. I was three years old when we moved into my childhood home. Prior to my family moving there, an old lady lived in that house. Before that, it was owned by the people who ran one of the local churches, that old church was destroyed by a fire. Also surrounding the house are several graveyards, one directly across the road and another on the other side of our large driveway. The one that really creeped me out was the private overgrown one that was connected to our backyard by a small wooded area. The stones were very old, crumbling, and some knocked over. I experienced the most activity upstairs in my bedroom and my parents' room. When I was about four, my older sister moved into her own room. I remember after that trying to sleep in my room at night but kept waking up to what sounded like people working in the kitchen. I didn't stop to consider the fact that everyone was upstairs in bed. One night it got so annoying I climbed in bed with my parents where I couldn't hear the sounds from downstairs. We talked for a little bit, then we fell asleep. I was almost asleep when I felt a strange presence, like someone was right by the bed. The air seemed to be thicker and I thought I was being watched. I told my mom this and that I was scared. She held on to me, telling me that there was nothing there, and after that I fell right to sleep. Years later, I was talking to my mom about that night and she admitted to feeling something weird, too. She stayed awake, holding me while she prayed. I'm thankful that she didn't share that she was afraid, too, at the time. When I was 11, my family moved to a larger home that was built just before the Civil War. It was in a small Missouri town. At school, the kids and teachers would say how the house was haunted and ask how we could stand living in it. We would often hear the footsteps on the stairs and the sound of humming. My mom said that she came into the kitchen one morning and caught a glimpse of a very large lady who was dressed like a housekeeper. She was cleaning the floor and humming. My dad was told that there had been slaves on the property and had found the remnants of slave houses. I had a bicycle wreck and had a concussion. My mom was sitting up with me holding a washcloth on my forehead and praying with her eyes closed when she felt a large, warm hand cover hers. She looked up and there was the slave lady she had seen before. She smiled at mom and made a motion to her that meant shoo. For some reason, Mom wasn't afraid and felt that it would be okay with her, so she went to bed. The next morning, I was sore and blurry-eyed 
but otherwise fine. I would love to go back and visit that house again. I hope whoever lives there now has had such a happy experience of their time there. It really was where history came alive. This happened a few hours ago, still scared to go downstairs. I'll preface this by saying I have been hearing faint voices and seeing things out of the corner of my eye, although I kind of assumed this was from lack of sleep. I'm a student with a lot of homework. I can't afford the luxury of sleep. Nothing else has happened in our house. My brother, 10, we'll call him Mark, and I were home alone for a few hours late at night. Basically, our house has two downstairs bathrooms about 20 feet away from each other. I ran downstairs to use the one in my parents' room, and when I came out, Mark was standing outside the other bathroom door down the dark hallway. I ask what he's doing, and he looks confused. That's when I notice the bathroom door is closed and the light's on. A moment passes and Mark runs into my arms, freaking out. He drags me upstairs and I ask him, what's going on? I was just talking to you, Mark yells. Apparently, the few minutes I was in the bathroom, Mark was having a full-on conversation with me in the other bathroom. Like they talked about the laundry basket and if I wanted to play video games. Usually, I wouldn't believe him, but I know when he's lying and this kid was freaked the hell out, crying and everything. Plus, I kind of heard Mark mumbling from across the hall when I was in the bathroom, but just assumed he was just playing or whatever. What really scares me is he said it was me talking to him, like my voice conversing with him. He won't go downstairs now, and I tried to make light of it and joke around, but really, I'm scared too. What was that? Nothing like that has happened the whole three years we've lived here. Does anyone have any answers? I experienced any number of bizarre happenings when I was in college. One was the poltergeist in my best friend's apartment. Strange stuff had started happening there early in the spring semester of my second year. Doors would lock by themselves. Strange scraping and banging sounds came from the walls. A sense of presence and being watched settled over things. Objects would disappear and be found elsewhere. Even my friend's skeptical roommate started looking behind him in the hallways. To put a name to these shenanigans, we started calling the ghost, or whatever, Fred. Fred seemed generally benign, more of a trickster than anything, but there was one memorable time when Fred apparently had enough of skeptics. A group had gathered at my friend's apartment, five guys not including myself as I remember. I was sitting on the floor, most were on a couch facing a wall, my friend was in a chair opposite me. We began talking about Fred. One of the company loudly proclaimed that they didn't believe in ghosts. At that point, a mighty slam came from the wall opposite us, as if someone or something had hit the wall beyond with incredible strength. The wall itself was a divider between the kitchen and the living area. No one was over there and there were no planes overhead to produce sonic booms or minor timblers below to account for it. As the slam startled us, a picture hanging on the wall opposite the guy who'd made the proclamation flew off the wall with enough force to slide across the carpet and stop at the guy's feet. He became a believer. Some of the rest of us applauded, way to go, Fred! My friend eventually moved from there to a new apartment in the same complex. Fred did not follow. I still remember it as one of the most amazing experiences of this type I've had. The multiple witnesses were like icing on the cake. I know that apartment complex is still there, and I often wonder, 20 years later now, if Fred 
is still knocking around. This happened in 1996, when I was 10. It isn't very dramatic, but it was quite scary enough for me. I was at a convent boarding school in the United Kingdom. The school was shaped like a Z with the fourth-year classroom at the bottom right at ground level with the third-year classroom between it and the rest of the school. A long corridor ran from the fourth-year classroom and past the third. It had a window at the top but above my height so I could actually see into the classroom. At weekends, the children could watch television after dinner and before bed. Towards the end of dinner, two girls would be sent to the third-year classroom to put chairs out, as this was where the only television set was. One winter evening, my friend Sherry and I were chosen for this job. I finished dinner before her and set off for the classroom. I got into the third-year classroom, and before I could put the lights on, I heard something from the fourth-year room I had just passed. It sounded like shuffling and desks being nudged and chairs moved. I couldn't see into the room, but the sounds were moving towards the door of the room. It seemed that whatever made the noise would get to the door before I could run past it back into the main part of the school. At that time of day, every member of the tiny school was in the kitchen or dining room. No one would be in that classroom in the dark. As I stood there, Sherry came down the corridor. The noises stopped and I switched the light on in the third-year room. I felt I had almost been caught by something, but characteristically for me, I didn't say anything about it. Later that winter, a couple of fourth-year girls had permission to go into their classroom after dark to fetch something. They didn't bother with the lights. In the room, they saw a small figure that laughed at them. It was not anyone from the school, and they ran out screaming. After this, no one was allowed into that part of the school at night. I'm just glad I never saw whatever it was. Imagine checking into your hotel room, only to experience poltergeist activity. No? Well, the Holiday Inn Express in Leeds City Center apparently has a poltergeist, at least according to this TripAdvisor reviewer. This hotel is great value for the money and is ideally situated in the center of Leeds and no more than a 20-minute walk to most places that you'll want to visit. The bar area is fine and the breakfast cooked and the basic fare that you would expect. The rooms are of ample size and the bed was very comfortable. Service from the hotel team was great throughout. Two things let it down for us, and hence not five stars. There were only decaf coffee sachets in the room and after a heavy night we needed lots of caffeine the next day. The room must be haunted. At about 5.30 a.m., all the lights in the room came on and the TV switched itself on and was blaring with sound. Upon checking out, we asked if this was some form of freaky wake-up system for heavy sleepers, but were assured that it was not and that they had never heard of this before. I've put it down to the fact that my other half has more than her share of gypsy blood. Hope she doesn't read this. However, be warned those of you brave enough to book this room. Hotel Globo in Formigena, Italy also seems suspect, according to this reviewer. Nice place, very clean and quite hospitable, excluding maybe the welcome at breakfast. It seemed an army discipline style rather than a relaxation one. For the rest, we had a very good time there enjoying also a small garden in front of the property and nice suggestions for dinner provided by the hotel staff. The only weird thing was a kind of paranormal activity in our room we came across for two evenings. Upon return to the room in the afternoon, we found the TV mysteriously switched on to the soap operas channel, twice in two days, and nobody could explain the reason for that strange fact. 
When it happened the second time, we did not even get scared. Nevertheless, if you plan the Ferrari factory and museum visit traveling by car, you for sure will find the location very convenient. And finally, how about this couple's scary experience at the Green Dragon in Hereford, England? I was a bit nervous staying at the hotel as we were aware that there had been paranormal activity on floor three. My husband reassured me that we'd be okay. We ate in the hotel restaurant the first night, but wasn't impressed and found that the so-called buffet was not appetizing with a lot of empty food containers. Poor. We had two incidents in the room of the glass containing our toothbrushes landing in the sink quite violently. Weird, but let it go, until the last morning at 1 a.m. when I was awoken by my hubby extremely nervous, pointing out that the kettle had suddenly come on there was no way that the kettle was faulty as it had all the safety stickers still attached. We couldn't wait to go home, although we will be returning to Hereford again, just to somewhere more suitable, without Mr. or Mrs. Ghost for company. Such poor reviews, and to think, some people would pay extra to lodge with a poltergeist. My mother, father, and I were visiting my grandparents in Tennessee. At the time, two of my uncles and one of my aunts were living with my grandparents, as the house belonged to one of my uncles. I adored visiting my grandmother and was very fond of her. Two weeks into our annual visit, I saw an old man standing in the doorway, smiling at me. To this very day, I can remember every detail about him. He was a little bald, and his skin was gray. He had a beige shirt on with almost black pants. I remember turning around to continue playing with my dolls and turning back at least two or three times and seeing the man still there pulling faces at me. I laughed, as I didn't know much at the time, which puzzled my mother and grandfather. I remember turning around about the fourth time and the old man winking at me and gesturing me to come closer. I shook my head no, and he started to storm at me. I jumped up and ran into the lounge where I jumped over a couch and hit my head. I never saw him again, but I do wonder who he was and why he wanted me to come closer. I can assure you, this story is 100% true. This took place during March, during spring break. If you dislike any paranormal things, I suggest you don't continue. My name is Alexa. I'm a young teenager with average grades and an average life. It happened when I was in the middle of the sixth grade. During spring break, I was invited to stay at my friend's house for two nights. It was the day I was heading to her house. This was the first time that I'd visited her dad's house and only ever been to her mother's place before. After a long drive, I slipped off my headphones that were blaring some Kesha song. I got out of the car with a wide grin and scurried eagerly to meet Lauren's father. He was a nice guy. He looked normal, completely typical. It was only a matter of time before I was dragged off towards Lauren's room. She shared a room with her older sister, McKenna, we spent about three hours just chatting and lounging. I don't know how to describe it, but I would always get this odd vibe in that room. After a good movie marathon, we were all pretty tired. I climbed up into the top bunk of the bed to meet up with Lauren, whom was fumbling around with her iPod. It was only a few moments later, and I was out. I was asleep. I remember waking up with half-lidded eyes, my body was turned to face the entire room. I reached for my iPad, which was by my feet. I quickly eyed the clock before huffing. It was around 3.15 a.m. My eyes only barely glanced across the room until I came across the chair, which was oddly in the middle of the room. 
It was Lauren's desk chair. It spun, then I realized there was something seated in the chair. It was a pale-skinned girl. Her hair was long and white, and everything she wore was white. She just spun around in the chair. Having been half awake, I only assumed it was McKenna or Lauren. I easily fell back asleep without a second thought. When I woke up that morning, Lauren was found sleeping in the hallway with blankets wrapped tightly around her torso. McKenna was asleep in the bottom bunk. I wondered why the heck Lauren was in the hallway. When I asked her, all she said was that I was thrashing around in the top bunk, so she just let me be in case she would get a black eye. Then I mentioned the girl in the chair. She, of course, was very confused. I remember the look on her face that just screamed how creeped out she was. She denied that she was the one spinning in the desk chair. When McKenna awoke, we bombarded her with the same questions. Still, they were both denying. Desperate, we all scurried downstairs where sat Lauren's father and her little brother. We bombarded them with questions, even though we knew it was a girl spinning in the chair, not a male. To this day, I have no idea what I saw, but I can assure you it wasn't anything I know. I slept there a few more times and everything was normal, except one night. McKenna and Lauren had shifted their bunk bed to face a different direction as they had just received the new TV set. What I liked the most is that the desk wasn't in the line of sight if you were to wake up in the middle of the night. After watching some action movies, I'd fallen asleep. Once again, upon the top bunk. I awoke around the same time, facing the wall. I couldn't see anything around me from my position. I could hear slight bickering from the bottom bunk, fighting over space on the mattress. That's when I realized Lauren and McKenna were attempting to share the bottom bunk due to my thrashing. I was never a gentle sleeper. I guess Lauren had something to anger McKenna. That's what I felt, as if something was behind me. I reluctantly rolled over. Across the room, by the tall lamp and by the window, was something tall. It was tall and cloaked up. I couldn't see a face. I stared at it for what felt like an eternity, just eyeing it with a wide pair of shocked eyes. I quickly beckoned for Lauren to turn on the lights. I expected her to go towards the light switch by the entrance of the room. Instead, she had wandered towards the lamp. When a rising panic happened, my knees grew weak. I knew I was about to lose my best friend. That is, until the light flickered back on. Lauren turned to me with a confused expression. I simply ushered her off and thanked her before giving off a simple excuse. I made sure to explain the whole truth the next day. To this day, Lauren will joke and say I'm delusional. But now, I don't know what I saw. But everything is different. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. In all the time I have done paranormal investigation, I have experienced some of the strangest things. Some not so scary, and some would make the hair on my neck stand up. Quite a few stories I can tell you would totally freak you out, but one story in particular, well, let's just say would leave you wondering. 
We lived in an apartment for about three years and strange things would occur. Shadows moving in and out of the rooms. Things going missing and turning up somewhere totally different. In this apartment, there was a basement. I wanted to put a little workshop down there as I worked with wood for a long time and wanted to have a wood shop. Now, I know some of you think basements are creepy. Well, they are. And I love having a basement still. I can do a lot of things in a basement. As time went on, I slowly bought equipment so I could start making things. My wife, who loved angels, often asked me to make her some. So I would, and when I showed her, she fell in love with them. My daughter, she loves anything dragon-related. She'd asked me to make her something out of wood, so one day I made her a 3D dragon drawing. I used four panes of glass, and with each, I would draw a little something on them. I then put the panes together and made a wood frame for it. She absolutely loved it. I made her a plaque for her doorway that read, In here there be dragons. She asked me to hang it up outside her door. I did, and I must say it did look good. Now, as I gathered more wood for my projects, I noticed little things happening. Wood would be moved around. I know how I set up my wood because I had shelves and a place on the workbench for it. The wood on the bench would be somewhere else on the workbench. I asked my wife and daughter if they'd been down in the basement messing around the bench. They both said no. I said okay and went on with what I was doing. I placed the wood back where it was and did some more work. The next morning before work I went down and saw there were six pieces of wood that were on the floor. I thought, okay, how did this happen? So I picked them up and put them back on the shelf. I went to work and came home after a 12-hour day. I asked how things were here today, and my wife said she heard something down in the basement. I said, what does it sound like? She said it sounded like some of your wood was falling off the shelf. I went down, and one of the shelves had fallen over. I have no idea how this happened. I know the shelves were strong enough to hold the wood, so I picked up all the wood and reset the shelf and put the wood back. The next day, which was a Saturday, my daughter was downstairs in the basement, changing her shirt. She had the shirt about halfway on when she heard someone or something say, Hello. She said she ran back upstairs and slammed the door shut. She yelled out, I hate that freaking basement! She told me what happened and I said, what did the voice sound like, male or female? She said, female. I asked, did it sound like an adult or a child? She said it sounded like a child. This got me to wondering if there was a cause for all the things happening down there. So I thought I'd set up a voice recorder in hopes of catching a voice, maybe. So that evening, my daughter and I set up a voice recorder on the workbench. I set it to run for 10 hours long enough to capture anything. I set the recorder that night. The next morning I got up, made coffee, made my wife and daughter breakfast. I went down after to get the recorder. I went back up and sat the recorder on the table in the living room. Got myself a cup of coffee, sat down, my daughter sat with me after eating her breakfast and we both started listening to the recording. About 20 minutes in, we both heard wood being shuffled on the workbench. Then, after that, we heard wood being dropped on the floor. We were looking at one another like, what did we just hear? After we listened to the recording, I went down and saw wood scattered on the bench and floor. I called a friend of mine and told him what happened. He came over and he saw this too. He said, if you want to see who or what is doing this, take some talcum powder and spread it by the workbench and out to where the stairs are. That way you'll see who's doing it. So I did what he suggested and left the basement alone. The next day, I went down in hopes of seeing footprints in the powder, but nothing. So I left it alone, and the next day I went down to see. Again, nothing. Leaving it still, I checked the third day and found little footprints in the powder. These prints were smaller than my daughter's, so I knew it wasn't her. Anyway, if it was, she would have left a trail of powder leading upstairs. I told my wife and daughter what I found, my wife being the skeptic one. That's nice. 
My daughter, on the other hand, when I told her, she said, I believe it. Knowing what I knew and what was causing it, I left it alone. I felt this spirit was playing games with me and thought it was funny. About three months went by, and my friend bought some new equipment and asked if he could try it out at my house. Of course, I said yes, and so he set up all his stuff down in my basement, the place with the most activity. We set up, ran wires upstairs to the monitors, and had my daughter man the monitors. He and I went back down with voice recorders and started doing EVP, electronic voice phenomena. We did this for about two hours, asking all kinds of questions. He said he felt something brush against him. He looked, but nothing was there. We continued our session and then went back up. First, we listened to the recordings. Fifteen minutes in, we hear this voice plain as day. It sounded like a little girl's voice. The voice said clear as day, help me. We all looked at one another and chills ran down my spine. My daughter was freaked to no end. I called up to my wife to come down and listen. She did and she said something like, that's a Class A EVP. She wanted to listen to it again and she was elated that we caught something. So next we watched the video. Nothing much happened until about 20 minutes in. I swear to you this was amazing. We all watched as this light moved from behind the furnace, go along the wall, come out towards the camera. As it passed the camera, the video jumped. My mouth was wide open at this time. I said, play it back. We did, and you could see what looked like a head and shoulders moving towards the camera. I thought, wow, now that is something. My friend, who had never seen something like this, was mesmerized still looking at the screen. To this day, I can still see the image and hear the voice saying, help me. My grandmother's house is an old style Victorian house where there's one long hallway and all rooms are off the hallway. She's had this house since my father was about two years old. She and my grandfather lived about an hour or so away from us, so on school holidays I would go and visit them for a week at a time. I used to sleep in my father's old room, with the door open, and opposite the doorway, on the wall, was a long clothes rack where my grandparents would put their coats, scarves, and hats, etc. Some nights, in the middle of the night, I would wake up to a tall man, about seven or eight foot tall, huge, scruffy beard, wearing a beanie and a huge, big jacket, standing at the very end of the bed. The bed faced the doorway out to the hallway. I would sort of describe him as a lumberjack fisherman type. I would scream and yell, and the man would slowly and calmly turn around and walk back down the hallway towards the front door. My grandmother would come in and ask what was the matter, and when I told her what I saw, she brushed it off as having a bad dream and that I was just seeing the coats hanging on the coat rack, not a man, and told me to go back to sleep. Mind you, I don't normally have dreams, and when I do, the things that happen in them come true, sort of like a premonition. This happened a few times over the years, and each time my grandmother would tell me the exact same thing, that it was just two coats or a bad dream. Fast forward to when I was 18 or 19. I would go and visit my grandmother for the day, and this particular day, somehow, we got chatting about the bad dreams I used to have about the lumberjack man in the night. My grandmother then says to me, Oh, you mean the ghost. I call him Frank. And I was like, what? She then explains to me that ever since they bought the house, this man has been in there and she sees him all the time. And if she wakes up in the middle of the night and he's at the end of her bed, she usually says hello and goes back to sleep. She said that he's very friendly and has never done any harm, so has never bothered to ask him to leave or anything. 
I had to ask her a few times to make sure she wasn't pulling my leg or anything, but she told me she never wanted to tell me when I was young because she thought I wouldn't be able to sleep there again. So when I go home that afternoon, I was sitting at the kitchen table with my mom talking to her about the conversation I'd had with my grandmother that day, and my dad walks in and overhears the conversation and says that he has seen the exact same ghost. Before I even described to mom what he looked like, dad described him exactly how I remembered him to look. He swore to me that he had seen him before and basically confirmed what my grandmother had told me. So, turns out this ghost has been roaming around my grandmother's place for a good 50 years, but we don't know why or how he got there. He really is pretty harmless, though. This occurrence happened about one and a half years ago. This is not a scary story, but I want to tell it to you because it is my precious experience. It happened in my house. At that time, I'd been studying throughout the night. I went to bed about 5 a.m. and I dreamed. In the dream, I met a man. He was my relative. I was surprised because he had died about a half a year before. I talked with him and touched his arm. He touched my arm and squeezed it strongly but affectionately. Then I woke up. I knew that this occurrence wasn't only a dream because the mark of his hand where he had touched me was still vividly there on my arm. I knew that he still existed somewhere. I cried very much after that. A while ago, I worked in a department store in the downtown Sakai area of Nagoya, selling fresh juice to the customers. I met many kinds of people, some of them strange. I'd like to tell you about one elderly woman. She was about 80. However, her appearance was quite peculiar. The department store I worked at had many kinds of customers, but most of them looked elegant and rich. This lady, however, did not apply. She looked miserable and eccentric. She came to my store and seemed to be shopping for juice. I asked her which juice she would like to buy, but she kept speaking next to her. I thought she had come with company, but when I looked beside her, I soon realized there was no one there but her. I guess she was speaking next to her for about five minutes, which is a long time finally she walked away, still talking to someone who was invisible. Maybe she and her unseen company couldn't come to a conclusion of which juice to buy. I told this story to my co-worker. She told me that that old woman sometimes came into the store and she was always talking with someone you couldn't see. Once when my co-worker talked to the woman, she told her that she was always with her friend who was a Zashiki Warashi which is a Japanese ghost that brings good luck. A Zashiki Warashi is a ghost that looks like a young child and inhabits your house. If you treat it kindly, it will bring good fortune to you and your household. The lady said her Zashiki Warashi was with her always, protecting her and bringing her good luck. A few months later, I saw her again in the store. That time, she also said something to her company but I could see no one. I always felt there was something wrong with my first apartment from the moment I stepped through the front door. It wasn't that it was run down or derelict, It was actually a really nice apartment, painted brightly and was actually very conveniently near a shopping mall. I moved into the house in May 1985. At first, trivial things would happen. 
I had a big poster of Eddie Murphy fall on the wall in my bedroom several times. I heard some creaks and had a few unimportant things go missing around the house. One of the strangest incidents took place in the bedroom. I would play music at night after I'd finished school. At least once a week, my boombox would eat my tapes. I tried replacing the boombox. I'd buy brand new tapes, but they would always get chewed up. It didn't bother me much, though. I was single, living alone, and enjoying my independence. I just tried to ignore the negative vibe of the place. Getting a TV reception in that house was impossible, so I would spend much of my time listening to music, reading, and cramming for exams. I would normally stay up until 11 p.m. and then get some sleep. One night, I felt something tapping me. I ignored it. It kept tapping me. Awake and annoyed at this point, I sat up in bed. I saw a hand emerge out from under the bed and it tapped my leg. I looked under the bed expecting to see someone. Nothing. There was nothing under my bed. This is when things started to get strange. I stood up, turned the radio on, and went to get a glass of milk. I came back with my drink. The radio was turned off, and a sheet on the bed shot up in the air. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't even process what was happening. I tried to turn on the light. It wouldn't turn on. Then violent knocking came from the closet and bedroom doors. The boombox was pushed onto the floor. Posters came off the wall. My bookcase was pushed over. It was like something out of a movie. The whole room shook. I turned to leave when I felt something scratch my back. It felt like a claw. I was too hyped up to feel the pain, though. I ran down and out of that apartment. I wouldn't go inside again. I called my dad, who came over half asleep and went inside. When he came back out, he was white as a sheet. He didn't tell me what he saw. We hired a couple of guys to move my stuff out, and I moved back into my parents' place. Later, I learned that the house had been a drug den before it had been renovated for use by students. Apparently, the area had been one of the chief drug hangouts in the 1970s. I still wonder who, what, or why that place was haunted, but it goes to prove that a few cans of paint and some new doors does not change the feel of a house. That place needed to be knocked down, not renovated. This took place in the early 90s. I'd been married to my husband for just over a year, and we were going on vacation for the first time together. He had two children from a previous marriage, and we were visiting my parents' vacation home in California. It was going to be our dream vacation. We had planned this trip down to the very last detail. My husband and I got plenty of sleep. Early that morning, Alan, my husband, came into the room and asked quietly if I was asleep. I had my head covered up. I told him that I was trying to. He leaned over onto the bed with his knee on it to give me a kiss. And when I uncovered my head, there was a face floating in front of his. An actual face floating in front of his own. The face or image was that of an old man with a beard smiling at me. I could faintly see the shape of my husband's head behind this floating face but it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. I screamed out of shock and covered my head up again. Alan turned the light on and I tried to find whatever I thought I'd seen. In the end, he thought I'd still been dreaming and convinced me to come out from under the covers. It was still there and it terrified the living hell out of me. The image finally left his face, but I felt uneasy about the whole trip. I wanted to delay it but he wanted to go ahead. We got up and left for Florida about 4 a.m. It was almost as though the universe were working against us. We had problems at every step of the journey. The car would stall, roads would be closed, we even got stuck in the mud. 
every opportunity to halt our journey was taken. At one point, we were stalled for over an hour. We replaced the battery and started off again. When we finally reached the California border, we were nine hours away from my parents' place. What did we get? We got more car trouble. We ended up stopping at a hotel. The next day, we had decided to go home. We turned the radio on in the car and heard that in the opposite direction on the same highway, there was a 50-car pileup just a few miles from us. If we had gone on, we would have been involved and may have died. Providence? Fate? What caused our trouble that day? I was only about seven when this happened, but it still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. When I was seven, my mother had a garden gnome in the garden out by the front side of the house. She called it Sylvester for some odd reason. When I was younger, before I had started school, that garden gnome had been my only friend. The day I started school and came home, the gnome wasn't in the garden anymore. I looked and looked for it until finally I gave up and went inside. After I went inside, I heard a loud thump like something had fallen from the roof and landed on the ground in front of my bedroom window. At first, I thought it was just the cat, but I looked down to see that little gnome staring up at me. I never played with that garden gnome again. Even to this day, I am still deathly afraid of garden gnomes. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. I live in the country and have for several years. I live on one of my dad's rental properties. Next door to me is one of his properties that has stayed empty since the former owner died eight years ago. My brothers stayed there one night five years ago and swore up and down that the house we call Rudy's was haunted. They spoke about hearing voices, having their blankets yanked off multiple times and hearing footsteps above them when no one else was there. I always thought they were just drunk idiots. Until last December, when my youngest brother Mike came over to my place drunk and said we should go ghost hunting. I was shocked because of how petrified him and Cody, my other brother, were after that night, but was also excited. I decided to take my dog Sam with me, as I always feel safer with him around. We entered through the basement and began walking around. I was recording and asking if anyone wanted to speak to us. All they had to do was speak into the phone. I also took video and pictures. As we walked underneath what would be the kitchen, I heard above us a man and a woman's voice talking as if they were having a conversation. I was unable to hear what they were saying, but Mike, who was right next to me, heard nothing. From the get-go, Sam was spooked, but it only got worse the higher we went. Rudy's had a large five-room basement, which I call the first floor. Then there's the kitchen and dining and living room on the main floor, or the second floor. Above that is four large bedrooms on the third floor, and above that is the attic, or the fourth floor. Nothing really happened until we got to the third floor bedrooms. I have no idea why, but for some reason I've always felt uncomfortable 
on that third floor. When I'm outside, I don't like to look at the house, especially at the third floor. I always feel as if I'm being watched. There's one bedroom neither I nor Sam would enter. Just didn't like the feel of it. We made our way to the attic. As we go to the top of the stairs, I begin taking pictures and video. The whole time, Sam had his hackles raised and his tail between his legs, so I decided we should leave. We got back to my place and were looking through the pictures I had taken, and one that I had taken in the attic had a woman with shoulder-length brown hair facing us with her head turned towards my brother, who was about ten feet to my left. She had what looked like a white shirt on, and at her waist was either blue jeans or a blue skirt that went to the floor. To the right of her and down at her hips is what I can only describe as a big black wolf dog creature. What's so disturbing about the picture to me is that the wolf is staring straight at me, and to the left of the woman looks like a tumbleweed, but when you turn the phone sideways, it resembles a skull. I can honestly say I was terrified beyond belief. I also listened to the recordings of us walking through the house and asking my spirits who wanted to contact us to speak into my phone. What we heard on the recording sent goosebumps down my back and still do every time I listen to it. There's 10 minutes worth of us talking to each other, and at the 2 minute 34 second mark, you can hear me say, if there's anyone here that wants to speak to us, please speak into this phone. And a couple seconds after that, there's this whisper that says one word, rendezvous. I've tried to discreetly find out some history on the house, as I can't ask my dad, as he doesn't believe in ghosts. Mike said he could hear heavy breathing next to me in the video. To him, it sounded like a person with asthma breathing every time I talked, as if whatever is in Rudy's is attracted to me. Also, I have the EVP and ghost picture, but they're on my other phone. I have a new phone but can try to get a picture of my old phone's picture if people would want to really see it. Mike told me that same night at my place after leading Rudy's, he saw a dark shadow stand behind me as we stood in my kitchen and then it shot down my hallway. I would greatly appreciate input. Should I be worried that there's a possible ghost? What does that black dog want? Why did it stare malevolently at me? One last point, two years ago, some friends and I got drunk, made a Ouija board out of a beer box, yeah, I know, we're idiots, and went to Rudy's attic to try and contact spirits. Absolutely nothing happened, and I burned the box and glass we used afterwards. I've never done anything so stupid since, either. But did we open a door to the other side? The woman and dog are standing in the exact spot where we played the Ouija board, though. When Margaret Atwood wrote The Handmaid's Tale, published in 1985, she took inspiration from the rise of the Christian right in America during the 1970s and early 80s and the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran. But another, much older source of inspiration for Atwood was the story of a real-life woman in 17th century New England named Mary Webster, who may or may not have been related to Atwood. Some days, my grandmother would say we were related to her, and on other days, she would deny the whole thing because it wasn't very respectable, Atwood says. I was actually trying to write a novel about her, but unfortunately, I didn't know enough about the late 17th century to be able to do it. But I did write a long narrative poem called Half-Hanged Mary because she only got half-hanged. Bridget Marshall, an associate professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, has researched witchcraft cases that preceded the infamous Salem witch trials, and one of those cases was Mary Webster's of Hadley, Massachusetts. Marshall tells Webster's story this way. 
Hadley is a small, small community of Puritans. Church is very central to their lives. There's also a baseline level of absolute acceptance of and belief in witchcraft, that it is happening, that witches are talking to the devil and that the devil is active and walking around in New England causing trouble for the Puritans. In January of 1685, Philip Smith, a leading light of the community of Hadley, falls very ill, Marshall continues. He's very involved in the government, very involved in the church, a very well-respected man. The community says, wait a minute, why is Philip Smith suffering these torments? In the Puritan mind, they don't know what's happening, so they think it must be a witch. If someone who is so good and so pious could be in such pain and such torment, there must be a witch involved. They very quickly draw a line to Mary Webster. Local farmers claim that their cart horses sometimes refuse to go past Webster's home, which is one of the main roads. But if the man goes inside and beats Mary, then the horse will go past. So the idea developed that her supernatural powers could be stopped if they somehow physically assaulted her, Marshall says. Based on this, Marshall says the community decided that to help Smith, they will do something to Mary. A few years later, in 1689, Cotton Mather, a minister and author, publishes Memorable Providences, which includes a detailed account of Mary Webster and an even more detailed account of Philip Smith, her supposed victim, says Marshall. Memorable Providences helps set the stage for the Salem witch hysteria that begins in 1692, when the community murders 20 people and puts 150 more in jail over accusations of witchcraft. Mather's book fed into the idea that witches are among us. Look at the terrible things they're doing. Men like Philip Smith, good, Christian men are being killed by witches, quite literally, Marshall says. Not until 1767 does anyone mention Mary Webster's hanging. A later historian gives us that detail. Marshall says Cotton Mather says that they gave disturbance to her. What exactly the disturbance was is not quite clear, but we do know that she lives 11 years after the Philip Smith incident. So, no matter how much she was disturbed, whether it was by hanging or something else, she still survived him. You do think about these things off and on for a long time because you think about things to which you don't have the answers, Atwood says. And the thing that we'll never know is how did she make it through the night? How did she make it through the night? What was she doing all night when she was dangling from a tree? What was she thinking about? The Handmaid's Tale is dedicated to Mary Webster because she is an example of a female person wrongly accused, Atwood says, but she is slightly a symbol of hope because they didn't actually manage to kill her. She made it through. Sometimes we do not need to go back far in time to encounter an unexplained mystery. At the Marion Cemetery in Ohio, there is a giant sphere that moves without any apparent reason. How is it possible? What mysterious force is causing the ball's unexplained motion? It all started in 1896 when members of the Charles B. Merchant family decided to spruce up their family plot in Marion Cemetery and make it more of a focal point. A series of small, black granite spheres were arranged in a large circle to mark the family plot. In the center of the circle, the family erected a five-foot-tall granite monument engraved with the family name. On top of this monument was placed an enormous 5,200-pound black granite sphere which was polished once it was in place. All in all, the merchant family plot was a stunning sight and it quickly became a popular attraction in the cemetery. But it wasn't until a few years later that people began to notice that there was something weird going on with that giant sphere. As hard as it was to believe, the two-and-a-half-ton sphere appeared to be moving. 
The movement wasn't visible to the naked eye, but there was no denying that it was moving. All one had to do was look at the sphere and they could see that the unpolished portion of the orb, the part that was originally in contact with the base of the monument, was now fully visible. What's more, there were no other markings on the sphere to suggest how it had been moved. It was as if it had been gently lifted from its base and turned ever so slightly. But that was impossible. Or was it? Concerned, the merchant family hired workers who used a crane to lift the sphere and return it to its original position on the base of the monument. That seemed to do the trick. For a while. But as the years rolled on, it wasn't long before the unpolished portion of the sphere began poking out once more. Several other attempts were made to reset the sphere, but all efforts proved fruitless. But that was fine for the curiosity seekers, who began flocking to the cemetery in droves to catch a glimpse of the mysterious revolving ball. Of course, many were disappointed when their visions of a wildly spinning ball were dashed at the sight of a virtually motionless sphere. But it did still attract the attention of Ripley's Believe It or Not!, who featured the monument in 1929. As more and more people visited Marion Cemetery, the number of explanations for the sphere's movement also increased. Everyone seemed to have their own theory, which ranged from gravitational pull to more bizarre tales of the monument being cursed or even possessed. Whatever the reason, the sphere continues to move even today, creeping along at an average of two inches a year. In fact, the unpolished portion is now fully exposed and is slowly making its way towards the top of the sphere. And it's not uncommon to encounter people in the cemetery taking measurements and scrawling down numbers in a notebook as they track the stone's progress. So it seems that even though it wasn't the way they had intended it, the merchants got their wish. Their family plot has become a focal point of the area. No one knows why the sphere keeps moving, be it from imperceptible vibration or perhaps ghostly intervention as some would have it. But no matter the cause, the merchant giant sphere at the cemetery rolls on and remains an unsolved mystery. Imaginary friends. Pretend playmates or something more sinister. The following five creepy tales come from reddit.com and show that imaginary friends aren't always the stuff of make-believe. The Girl in the Closet When my daughter was three, she had an imaginary friend named Kelly who lived in her closet. Kelly sat in a little rocking chair while she slept, played with her, etc. Typical imaginary friend stuff. Anyway, fast forward two years. The wife and I are watching the new Amityville, the one with Ryan Reynolds, and our daughter walks out right when the dead girl goes all black-eyed. Far from being disturbed, she said, that looks like Kelly. Kelly who, we say? You know, the dead girl that lives in my closet. The Man in the Dresser When I was younger, I had an imaginary friend who lived in this massive antique dresser. We'd chill out, and I vividly remember him telling me stories, although I have no recollection of what they actually were. I remember one day talking to my dad about it. And when I started telling him about my dresser buddy, he wanted to know his name. It was something innocent like Peter or Patrick, but I can still see him going white in the face. I drew Peter or Patrick out for him, and the very next day, him and my uncle took out that dresser and burned it. It wasn't until a few years later when I found out my dad's little brother, my uncle, also had that same friend with the same name who lived in the same antique dresser. After a few months of the typical imaginary friend stuff, my uncle started having night terrors and couldn't sleep because of Peter or Patrick. It got so bad 
that they had to move him out of his room before he managed to get back to normal. The Lady in the Wall When my son was about three, he had an imaginary friend in his room who he used to talk to all the time. He would tell us stories about things that she would tell him, and we'd hear him chatting to her at bedtime. We actually thought it was pretty cute. After a few months, my son said he wasn't friends with her anymore. We figured he was over his phase of seeing her, so we were surprised to hear him still talking to her at night. Then he started not wanting to go to bed and started having very bad dreams. At some point, we ended up asking a lot of questions about her. We had assumed she was a little girl, but apparently she was 47. She lived in the wall, and he stopped being friends with her because she wanted him to call her Mummy. Her name was something like Margaret. She wanted him to come and live in the wall with her. He's told her he didn't want to talk to her anymore, but she wouldn't go away. We eventually moved, and he stopped talking about her. The Girl Upstairs I used to break into houses as a little kid. I lived in a really run-down part of town with a huge amount of foreclosed and empty houses, so I would pry out the window screens and if the windows were unlocked, I'd crawl inside. I was maybe like five or six. In one abandoned house, there was always this young Hispanic girl hanging out in the upstairs bathroom. I'd go up there and she would talk to me and we'd play tag and hide and go seek and truth or dare. I'd always invite her home for dinner, but she said that she couldn't leave because she had to wait for her mom to come home. Well, I guess it made sense to me at the time, but when I think back, there was nothing in that house, not even silverware in the kitchen drawers. The carpets were all mildewed and it was seriously empty. I don't think she could have actually been there. Together Forever I have a niece I'm taking care of while her mother is in the hospital. Her father died before she was born and her mother was diagnosed with cancer. She has imaginary friends, which is okay with me, but when they tell her to finish her dinner quickly to play and ask her to stay up all night, it worries me. She started crying when they were playing because they said they will not be here anymore when she turns six. So a week before her birthday, her friends brought her up near this cliff we live by and told her they could be together if she jumped. She refused. All the while, I was making dinner, and when I noticed her gone, I panicked and searched for her everywhere. I found her sitting on the edge of the cliff. She said, I don't want to jump. It's going to hurt bad. I get to see mommy if I do. What about my aunt? Can she go? This was when I stepped in and picked her up and said we had to go eat dinner. As we left, she waved goodbye to the cliff. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. For something different, Here's a Dark Archives Creepypasta. Sunday I'm not sure why I'm writing this down on paper and not on my computer. I guess I've just noticed some odd things. It's not that I don't trust the computer, I just need to organize my thoughts. I need to get down all the details somewhere objective, somewhere I know that what I write can't be deleted or changed. Not that that's happened, 
It's just… everything blurs together here, and the fog of memory lends a strange cast to things. I'm starting to feel cramped in this small apartment. Maybe that's the problem. I just had to go and choose the cheapest apartment, the only one in the basement. The lack of windows down here makes day and night seem to slip by seamlessly. I haven't been out in a few days because I've been working on this programming project so intensely. I suppose I just wanted to get it done. Hours of sitting and staring at a monitor can make anybody feel strange, I know, but I don't think that's it. I'm not sure when I first started to feel like something was odd. I can't even define what it is. Maybe I just haven't talked to anyone in a while. That's the first thing that crept up on me. Everyone I normally talk to online while I program has been idle, or they've simply not logged on at all. My instant messages go unanswered. The last email I got from anybody was a friend saying he'd talk to me when he got back from the store, and that was yesterday. I'd call with my cell phone, but reception's terrible down here. Yeah, that's it. I just need to call someone. I'm going to go outside. Well, that didn't work so well. As the tingle of fear fades, I'm feeling a little ridiculous for being scared at all. I looked in the mirror before I went out, but I didn't shave the two-day stubble I've grown. I figured I was just going out for a quick cell phone call. I did change my shirt, though, because it was lunchtime and I guessed that I'd run into at least one person I knew. Well, that didn't end up happening. I wish it did, though. When I went out, I opened the door to my small apartment slowly. A small feeling of apprehension had somehow already lodged itself in me, for some indefinable reason. I chalked it up to having not spoken to anyone but myself for a day or two. I peered down the dingy, gray hallway, made dingier by the fact that it was a basement hallway. On one end, a large metal door led to the building's furnace room. It was locked, of course. Two dreary soda machines stood by it. I bought a soda from one the first day I moved in, but it had a two-year-old expiration date. I'm fairly sure nobody knows these machines are even down here, or my cheap landlady just doesn't care to get them restocked. I closed my door softly and walked the other direction, taking care not to make a sound. I have no idea why I chose to do that, but it was fun, giving in to the strange impulse not to break the droning hum of these soda machines, at least for the moment. I got to the stairwell and took the stairs up to the building's front door. I looked through the heavy door's small square window and received quite the shock. It was definitely not lunchtime. City gloom hung over the dark street outside, and the traffic lights at the intersection in the distance blinked yellow. Dim clouds, purple and black from the glow of the city, hung overhead. Nothing moved, save the few sidewalk trees that shifted in the wind. I remember shivering, though I wasn't cold. Maybe it was the wind outside. I could vaguely hear it through the heavy metal door, and I knew it was that unique kind of late night wind, the kind that was constant, cold, and quiet, save for the rhythmic music it made as it passed through countless unseen tree leaves. I decided not to go outside. Instead, I lifted my cell phone to the door's little window and checked the signal meter. The bars filled up the meter and I smiled time to hear somebody else's voice, I remember thinking, relieved. It was such a strange thing, to be afraid of nothing. I shook my head, laughing at myself silently. I hit speed dial for my best friend Amy's number and held the phone up to my ear. It rang once, but then it stopped. Nothing happened. I listened to silence for a good 20 seconds and then hung up, I frowned and looked at the signal meter again. Still full. 
I went to dial her number again, but then my phone rang in my hand, startling me. I put it up to my ear. Hello? I asked, immediately fighting down a small shock at hearing the first spoken voice in days, even if it was my own. I had gotten used to the droning hum of the building's inner workings, my computer and the soda machines in the hallway. There was no response to my greeting at first, but then finally a voice came. Hey, said a clear, male voice, obviously of college age, like me. Who's this? John, I replied, confused. Oh, sorry, wrong number, he replied, then hung up. I lowered the phone slowly and leaned against the thick brick wall of the stairwell. That was strange. I looked at my received calls list, but the number was unfamiliar. Before I could think on it further, the phone rang loudly, shocking me yet again. This time I looked at the caller before I answered. It was another unfamiliar number. This time I held the phone up to my ear, but said nothing. I heard nothing but the general background noise of a phone. Then a familiar voice broke my tension. John? Was the single word in Amy's voice. I breathed a sigh of relief. Ah, it's you, I replied. Who else would it be? She responded. Oh, the number. I- I'm at a party on 7th Street and my phone died just as you called me. This is someone else's phone, obviously. Oh, okay, I said. Where are you? She asked. My eyes glanced over the drab, whitewashed cylinder block walls and the heavy metal door with its small window. At my building, I sighed, just feeling cooped up. I didn't realize it was so late. You should come here, she said, laughing. Nah, I don't feel like looking for some strange place by myself in the middle of the night, I said, looking out the window at the silent, windy street that secretly scared me just a tiny bit. I think I'm just gonna keep working or go to bed. Nonsense, she replied. I can come get you. Your building is close to 7th Street, right? How drunk are you? I asked lightheartedly. You know where I live. Oh, of course, she said abruptly. I guess I can't get there by walking, huh? Uh, You could if you wanted to waste half an hour, I told her. Right, she said. Okay, I have to go. Good luck with your work. I lowered the phone once more, looking at the numbers flash as the call ended. Then the droning silence suddenly reasserted itself in my ears. The two strange calls in the eerie street outside just drove my home aloneness into this empty stairwell. Perhaps from having seen too many scary movies, I had the sudden inexplicable idea that something could look in the door's window and see me, some sort of horrible entity that hovered at the edge of aloneness just waiting to creep up on unsuspecting people that strayed too far from other human beings. I knew the fear was irrational, but nobody else was around, so I jumped down the stairs, ran down the hallway into my room, and closed the door as swiftly as I could while still staying silent. Like I said, I feel a little ridiculous for being scared of nothing, and the fear had already faded. Writing this down helps a lot. It makes me realize that nothing is wrong. It filters out half-formed thoughts and fears and leaves only cold, hard facts. It's late, I got a call from a wrong number, and Amy's phone died, so she called me back from another number. Nothing strange is happening. Still, there was something a little off about that conversation. I know it could have just been the alcohol she'd had, or... Was it even her that seemed off to me? Or was it? Yeah, that was it. I didn't realize it until this moment writing these things down. I knew writing things down would help. She said she was at a party, but I only heard silence in the background. Of course, that doesn't mean anything in particular, as she could have gone outside to make the call. No, that couldn't be it either. I didn't hear the wind. I need to see if the wind is still blowing. Monday. Forgot to finish writing last night. 
I'm not sure what I expected to see when I ran up the stairwell and looked out the heavy metal door's window. I'm feeling ridiculous. Last night's fear seems hazy and unreasonable to me now. I can't wait to get out into the sunlight. We gotta check my email, shave, shower, and finally get out of here. Wait, I think I heard something. It was thunder. That whole sunlight and fresh air thing didn't happen. I went out into the stairwell and up the stairs only to find disappointment. The heavy metal door's little window showed only flowing water as torrential rain slammed against it. Only a very dim, gloomy light filtered in through the rain. But at least I knew it was daytime, even if it was a gray, sickly wet day. I tried looking out the window and waiting for lightning to illuminate the gloom, but the rain was too heavy and I couldn't make out anything more than vague, weird shapes moving at odd angles in the waves washing down the window. Disappointed, I turned around, but I didn't want to go back to my room. Instead, I wandered further up the stairs, past the first floor and the second. The stairs ended at the third floor, the highest floor in the building. I looked through the glass that ran up the outer wall of the stairwell but it was that warped, thick kind that scatters the light, not that there was much to see through the rain to begin with. I opened the stairwell door and wandered down the hallway. The ten or so thick wooden doors painted blue a long time ago were all closed. I listened as I walked, but it was the middle of the day, so I wasn't surprised that I heard nothing but the rain outside. As I stood there in the dim hallway, listening to the rain, I had the strange, fleeting impression that the doors were standing like silent granite monoliths erected by some ancient, forgotten civilization for some unfathomable guardian purpose. Lightning flashed, and I could have sworn that for just a moment the old, grainy blue wood looked just like rough stone. I laughed at myself for letting my imagination get the best of me. But then it occurred to me that the dim gloom and lightning must mean there was a window somewhere in the hallway. A vague memory surfaced, and I suddenly recalled that the third floor had an alcove and an inset window halfway down the floor's hallway. Excited to look out into the rain and possibly see another human being, I quickly walked over to the alcove, finding the large, thin glass window. Rain washed down it, as with the front door's window, but I could open this one. I reached a hand out to slide it open, but hesitated. I had the strangest feeling that if I opened that window, I would see something absolutely horrifying on the other side. Everything has been so odd lately. So I came up with a plan, and I came back here to get what I needed. I don't seriously think anything will come of it, but I'm bored, it's raining, and I'm going stir-crazy. I came back to get my webcam. The court isn't long enough to reach the third floor by any means, so instead I'm going to hide it between the two soda machines at the dark end of my basement hallway, run the wire along the wall and under my door, and put black duct tape over the wire to blend it in with the black plastic strip that runs along the base of the hallway's walls. I know this is silly, but... I don't have anything better to do. Well, nothing happened. I propped open the hallway to stairwell door, steeled myself, then flung the heavy front door open and ran like hell down the stairs to my room and slammed the door. I watched the webcam on my computer intently, seeing the hallway outside my door and most of the stairwell. I'm watching it right now. And I don't see anything interesting. I just wish the camera's position was different, so that I could see out the front door. Hey, somebody's online. I got out an older, less functional webcam that I had in my closet to video chat with my friend online. I couldn't really explain to him why I wanted to video chat, but it felt good to see another person's face. He couldn't talk very long, and we didn't talk about anything meaningful, but I feel much better. My strange fear has almost passed. I would feel completely better, but there was something 
odd about our conversation. I know that I've said that everything has seemed odd, but still, he was very vague in his responses. I can't recall one specific thing that he said. No particular name or place or event, but he did ask for my email address to keep in touch. Wait, I just got an email. I'm about to go out. I just got an email from Amy that asked me to meet her for dinner at the place we usually go to. I do love pizza, and I've just been eating random food from my poorly stocked fridge for days, so I can't wait. Again, I feel ridiculous about the odd couple of days I've been having. I should destroy this journal when I get back. Oh, hey look, another email. Oh my god. I almost left the email and opened the door. I almost opened the door! I almost opened the door, but I read the email first. It was from a friend I hadn't heard from in a long time, and it was sent to a huge number of emails that must have been every person he'd saved in his address list. It had no subject, and it said simply, seen with your own eyes, don't trust them they. What the hell is that supposed to mean? The words shock me, and I keep going over and over them. Seen with your own eyes, don't trust them, they. Is it a desperate email sent just to us? Something happened? The words are obviously cut off without finishing. On any other day, I would have dismissed this as spam from a computer virus or something, but the words, seen with your own eyes. I can't help but read over this journal and think back on the last few days and realize that I have not seen another person with my own eyes or talked to another person face to face. The webcam conversation with my friend was so strange, so vague, so eerie now that I think about it. Was it eerie or is the fear clouding my memory? My mind toys with the progression of events I've written here, pointing out that I have not been presented with one single fact that I did not specifically give out unsuspectingly. The random wrong number that got my name and the subsequent strange return call from Amy, the friend that asked for my email address, I messaged him first when I saw him online, and then I got my first email a few minutes after that conversation. Oh my God! That phone call with Amy! I said over the phone, I said that I was within half an hour's walk of 7th Street. They know I'm near there. What if they're trying to find me? Where is everyone else? Why haven't I seen or heard anyone else in days? Oh, no, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. I need to calm down. This madness needs to end. I don't know what to think. I ran about my apartment furiously, holding my cell phone up to every corner to see if it got a signal through the heavy walls. Finally, in the tiny bathroom near one ceiling corner, I got a single bar. Holding my phone there, I sent a text message to every number in my list. Not wanting to betray anything about my unfounded fears, I simply sent, You seen anyone face to face lately? At that point, I just wanted any reply back. I didn't care what the reply was, or if I embarrassed myself. I tried to call someone a few times, but I couldn't get my head up high enough, and if I brought my cell phone down even an inch, it lost signal. Then I remembered the computer and rushed over to it, instant messaging everyone online. Most were idle or away from their computer. Nobody responded. My messages grew more frantic, and I started telling people, where I was and to stop by in person for a host of barely passable reasons. I didn't care about anything by that point, I just needed to see another person. I also tore apart my apartment looking for something that I might have missed, some way to contact another human being without opening the door. I know it's crazy, I know it's unfounded, but what if, what if? I just need to be sure. I taped the phone to the ceiling, just in case. Tuesday. The phone rang! 
Exhausted from last night's rampage, I must have fallen asleep. I woke up to the phone ringing and ran into the bathroom, stood on the toilet and flipped open the phone taped to the ceiling. It was Amy, and I feel so much better. She was really worried about me and apparently had been trying to contact me since the last time I talked to her. She's coming over now, and yes, she knows where I am without me telling her. I feel so embarrassed. I'm definitely throwing this journal away before anyone sees it. I don't even know why I'm writing in it now. Maybe it's just because it's the only communication I've had at all since God knows when. I look like hell, too. I looked in the mirror before I came back in here. My eyes are sunken, my stubble is thicker, and I just look generally unhealthy. My apartment is trashed. But I'm not going to clean it up. I think I need someone else to see what I've been through. These past few days have not been normal. I'm not one to imagine things. I know I've been the victim of extreme probability. I probably missed seeing another person a dozen times. I just happened to go out when it was late at night or the middle of the day when everyone was gone. Everything's perfectly fine. I know this now. Plus, I found something in the closet last night that has helped me tremendously. A television. I set it up just before I wrote this, and it's on in the background. Television has always been an escape for me, and it reminds me that there is a world beyond these dingy brick walls. I'm glad Amy's the only one that responded to me after last night's frantic pestering of everyone I could contact. She has been my friend for years. She doesn't know it, but I count the day that I met her among one of the few moments of true happiness in my life. I remember that warm summer day fondly. It seems a different reality from this dark, rainy, lonely place. I feel like I spent days sitting in that playground, much too old to play, just talking with her and hanging around doing nothing at all. I still feel like I can go back to that moment sometimes, and it reminds me that this damn place is not all that there is. <sighs> Finally, a knock on the door. I thought it was odd that I couldn't see her through the camera I hid between the two soda machines. I figured it was bad positioning, like when I couldn't see out the front door. I should have known. I should have known. After the knock, I yelled through the door jokingly that I had a camera between the soda machines because I was embarrassed myself that I had taken this paranoia so far. Well, after I did that, I saw her image walk over to the camera and look down at it. She smiled and waved. Hey! She said to the camera brightly, giving it a wry look. It's weird. I know, I said into the mic attached to my computer. I've had a weird few days. Must have! she replied. Open the door, John. I hesitated. How could I be sure? Hey, uh, humor me a second here, I told her through the mic. Tell me one thing about us. Just prove to me you're you. She gave the camera a weird look. Um, all right, she said, slowly thinking. We met randomly at a playground where we both were way too old to be there. I sighed deeply as reality returned and fear faded. God, I had been so ridiculous. Of course it was Amy. That day wasn't anywhere in the world except in my memory. I never even mentioned it to anyone, not out of embarrassment, but out of a strange secret nostalgia and a longing for those days to return. If there was some unknown force at work trying to trick me as I feared, there was no way they could have known about that day. <laughs> All right, I'll explain everything, I told her. Be right there. I ran to my small bathroom and fixed my hair as best I could. I looked like hell, but she'd understand. Snickering at my own unbelievable behavior and the mess I'd made of the place, I walked to the door. I put my hand on the doorknob and gave the mess one last look. So ridiculous, I thought. My eyes traced over the half-eaten food lying on the ground, the overflowing trash bin, and the bed I'd tipped to the side looking for God knows what. 
I almost turned to the door and opened it, but my eyes fell on one last thing. The old webcam, the one I used for that eerily vacant chat with my friend. Its silent black sphere lay haphazardly tossed to the side. Its lens pointed at the table where this journal lay. An overwhelming terror took me as I realized that if something could see through that camera, it would have seen what I just wrote about that day. I asked her for any one thing about us, and she chose the only thing in the world that I thought they or it did not know. But it did. It did know. It could have been watching me the whole time. I didn't open that door. I screamed. I screamed in uncontrollable terror. I stomped on the old webcam on the floor. The door shook and the doorknob tried to turn, but I didn't hear Amy's voice through the door. Was the basement door made to keep out drafts too thick, or was Amy not outside? What could have been trying to get in if not her? What the hell is out there? I saw her on my computer through the camera outside. I heard her on the speakers through the camera outside, but was it real? How can I know? She's gone now. I screamed and shouted for help. I piled up everything in my apartment against the front door. Friday. At least I think it's Friday. I broke everything electronic. I smashed my computer to pieces. Every single thing on there could have been accessed by network access, or worse, altered. I'm a programmer, I know. Every little piece of information I gave out since this started, my name, my email, my location, none of it came back from outside until I gave it out. I have been going over and over what I wrote. I've been pacing back and forth, alternating between stark terror and overpowering disbelief. Sometimes I'm absolutely certain some phantom entity is dead set on the simple goal of getting me to go outside. Back to the beginning with the phone call from Amy. She was effectively asking me to open the door and go outside. I kept running it through in my head. One point of view says I've acted like a madman, and all of this is the extreme convergence of probability. Never going outside at the right times by pure luck. Never seeing another person by pure chance. Getting a random nonsense email from some computer virus at just the right time. The other point of view says that extreme convergence of probability is the reason that whatever's out there hasn't gotten me already. I keep thinking I never opened the window on the third floor. I never opened the front door until that incredibly stupid stunt with the hidden camera, after which I ran straight to my room and slammed the door. I haven't opened my own solid door since I flung open the front door of the building. Whatever's out there, if anything's out there, never made an appearance in the building before I opened the front door. Maybe the reason it wasn't in the building already was that it was elsewhere getting everyone else out. And then it waited until I betrayed my existence by trying to call Amy. A call which didn't work until it called me and asked me my name. Terror literally overwhelms me every time I try to fit the pieces of this nightmare together. That email, short, cut off, was it from someone trying to get word out? Some friendly voice desperately trying to warn me before it came? Seen with my own eyes, don't trust them. Exactly what I've been so suspicious of. It could have masterful control of all things electronic, practicing its insidious deception to trick me into coming outside. Why can't it get in? It knocked on the door and must have some solid presence. The door, the image of those doors in the upper hallway as guardian monoliths flashed back in my mind every time I traced this path of thoughts. If there is some phantom entity trying to get me to go outside, maybe it can't get through doors. I keep thinking back over all the books I've read or movies I've seen, trying to generate some explanation for this. Doors have always been such intense foci of human imagination, always seen as wards or portals of special importance. Or perhaps the door is just too thick? 
I know that I couldn't bash through any of the doors in this building, let alone the heavy basement ones. Aside from that, the real question is why does it even want me? If it just wanted to kill me, it could do it any number of ways, including just waiting until I starve to death. What if it doesn't want to kill me? What if it has some far more horrific fate in store for me? God, what can I do to escape this nightmare? A knock at the door. I told the people on the other side of the door I need a minute to think and I'll come out. I'm really just writing this down so I can figure out what to do. At least this time I heard their voices. My paranoia, and yes, I recognize I'm being paranoid, has me thinking of all sorts of ways that their voices could be faked electronically. There could be nothing but speakers outside, simulating human voices. Did it really take them three days to come talk to me? Amy is supposedly out there along with two policemen and a psychiatrist. Maybe it took them three days to think of what to say to me. The psychiatrist's claim could be pretty convincing if I decided to think this has all been a crazy misunderstanding and not some entity trying to trick me into opening the door. The psychiatrist had an older voice, authoritarian but still caring. I liked it. I'm desperate just to see someone with my own eyes. He said I have something called cyberpsychosis and I'm just one of a nationwide epidemic of thousands of people having breakdowns triggered by a suggestive email that got through somehow. I swear he said, got through somehow. I think he means spread throughout the country inexplicably, but I'm incredibly suspicious that the entity slipped up and revealed something. He said I'm part of a wave of emergent behavior that a lot of other people are having the same problem with the same fears, even though we've never communicated. That neatly explains the strange email about eyes that I got. I didn't get the original triggering email. I got a descendant of it. My friend could have broken down too and tried to warn everyone he knew against his paranoid fears. That's how the problem spreads, the psychiatrist claims. I could have spread it too with my texts and instant messages online to everybody I know. One of those people might be melting down right now after being triggered by something I sent them, something they might interpret any way that they want, something like a text saying, seen anyone face to face lately? The psychiatrist told me that he didn't want to lose another one, that people like me are intelligent and that's our downfall. We draw connections so well that we draw them even when they shouldn't be there. He said it's easy to get caught up in paranoia in our fast-paced world, a constantly changing place where more and more of our interaction is simulated. Well, I have to give him one thing. It's a great explanation. It neatly explains everything. It perfectly explains everything, in fact. I have every reason to shake off this nightmarish fear that something or consciousness or being out there wants me to open the door so it can capture me for some horrible fate worse than death. It would be foolish, after hearing that explanation, to stay in here until I starve to death just to spite the entity that might have gotten everyone else. It would be foolish to think that. After hearing that explanation, I might be one of the last people left alive on an empty world, hiding in my secure basement room spiting some unthinkable deceptive entity just by refusing to be captured. It's a perfect explanation for every single strange thing I've seen or heard, and I have every reason in the world to let all of my fears go and open the door. That's exactly why I'm not going to. How can I be sure? How can I know what's real and what's deception? All of these things with their wires and their signals that originate from some unseen origin. They're not real. I can't be sure. Signals through a camera, faked video, deceptive phone calls, emails, even the television lying broken on the floor. How can I possibly know it's real? It's just signals, waves, light. The door. It's bashing on the door. It's trying to get in. 
What insane mechanical contrivance could it be using to simulate the sound of men attacking the heavy wood so well? At least I'll finally see it with my own eyes. There's nothing left in here for it to deceive me with. I've ripped apart everything else. It can't deceive my eyes. Can it? Seen with your own eyes. Don't trust them. They… Wait, was that desperate message telling me to trust my eyes or warning me about my eyes too? Oh my god, what, what's the difference between a camera and my eyes? They both turn light into electrical signals. They're the same. I can't be deceived. I have to be sure. I have to be sure. Date unknown. I calmly asked for paper and a pen, day in and day out, until it finally gave them to me. Not that it matters. What am I going to do, poke my eyes out? The bandages feel like part of me now. The pain is gone. I figure this will be one of my last chances to write legibly, as, without my sight to correct mistakes, my hands will slowly forget the motions involved. This is a sort of self-indulgence, this writing. It's a relic of another time, because I'm certain everyone left in the world is dead, or something far worse. I sit against the padded wall day in and day out. The entity brings me food and water. It masks itself as a kind of nurse, as an unsympathetic doctor. I think it knows that my hearing has sharpened considerably now that I live in darkness. It fakes conversations in the hallways on the off chance that I might overhear. One of the nurses talks about having a baby soon. One of the doctors lost his wife in a car accident. None of it matters. None of it is real. None of it gets to me. Not like she does. That's the worst part. The part I almost can't handle. The thing comes to me, masquerading as Amy. Its recreation is perfect. It sounds exactly like Amy, feels exactly like her. It even produces a reasonable facsimile of tears that it makes me feel on its lifelike cheeks. When it first dragged me here, it told me all the things I wanted to hear. It told me that she loved me, that she had always loved me, that it didn't understand why I had this, that we could still have a life together, if only I would stop insisting that I was being deceived. It wanted me to believe, no, it needed me to believe that she was real. I almost fell for it too. I really did. I doubted myself for the longest time. In the end, though, it was all too perfect, too flawless, and too real. The false Amy used to come every day, and then every week, and finally stopped coming altogether. But I don't think the entity will give up. I think the waiting game is just another one of its gambits. I'll resist it for the rest of my life if I have to. I don't know what happened to the rest of the world, but I do know that this thing needs me to fall for its deceptions. If it needs that, then maybe, just maybe, I am a thorn in its agenda. Maybe Amy is still alive out there somewhere, kept alive only by my will to resist the deceiver. I hold on to that hope, rocking back and forth in my cell to pass the time. I will never give in. I will never break. I am a hero. The doctor read the paper the patient had scribbled on. It was barely readable, written in the shaky script of one who could not see. He wanted to smile at the man's steadfast resolve, a reminder of the human will to survive, but he knew that the patient was completely delusional. After all, a sane man would have fallen for the deception long ago. The doctor wanted to smile. He wanted to whisper words of encouragement to the delusional man. He wanted to scream, but the nerve filaments wrapped around his head and into his eyes made him do otherwise. His body walked into the cell like a puppet and told the patient once more that he was wrong and that there was nobody trying to deceive him.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.